Hello, I'm Dagny Zhu, Medical Director at Envision Eye Centers in Roland Heights, California. And today I'm joined by Dr. George Waring, Founder and Medical Director at Waring Vision Institute in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. So hi, George, how are you? Thank you for joining. Dagny, I'm great. And I'm delighted to get to do this with you. Gosh, it's such an honor to have you speak about the subject. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about advanced techniques and technology for guiding refractive surgery to reduce complications and achieve better visual outcomes for our patients. So let's get right to it. What can you tell us about some of the new corneal-based refractive procedures that are in the pipeline, and what potential benefits do you think we'll see from their use in practice? Well, Dagny, uh, it's a really exciting time uh, to be a, a corneal and lens-based refractive surgeon, as you know better than most. And we're so thankful to get to do what we do for a living, and uh, that is to improve quality of lives safely uh, and it's just, there's so much on the horizon. I'm just, I'm thrilled. Um, and, and you know, the neat thing about this is that the innovative cycle really goes in waves and we're really kind of coming out of a sort of a trough and heading towards a peak, I think. Um, a lot of that is multifactorial. Uh, you know, this is um, changes in uh, the landscape um, with our regulatory agencies and the FDA. Uh, we're, we're seeing more efficient approvals, and there's just great technology, and and it's it's just a really exciting time. Some of the neat things were there's really a sort of a sea change with lenticule extraction. Calex is uh, sort of the, the 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 scientific nomenclature that has been um, recently um, proposed uh, in both. Uh, Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery and, and Journal of Refractive Surgery uh, just this last month. The, just about every uh, strategic uh, has a lenticular extraction uh, um, device and or procedure in the pipeline. So just to clarify, CALEX stands for Keratorefractive Lenticular Extraction. Um, and that's a wonderful term that we can use to kind of categorize this umbrella of a uh, acronyms or alphabet suits that's coming out uh, with all the companies uh, developing their new uh, lenticular based uh, lenticular extraction based platforms. Do you think the future of refractive surgery is moving towards more of a lenticular based platform? And what do you think are the benefits versus what we currently have uh, with, you know, LASIK and PRK? You know, Dagny, we're always looking uh, outside the U.S. to kind of get a glimpse of the future. What we see is that lenticular extraction has really uh, gained major momentum in other areas of the world, such as uh, Europe and, and Asia. And I, I know that you had spent some time in Asia um, recently uh, looking at um, some of these uh, neat new technologies and love to get your perspective on this as well while we're together. But um, there's there's usually a reason for this and, uh, you know, the purported benefits are uh, compelling for sure. I mean, these are essentially flapless uh, vision correction procedures in a, with a single device in a single um, bed with, without moving the patient and uh, with very rapid um, uh, procedure uh, because, again, you're really just using one technology. The extraordinarily rare um, issues that we see with, with other forms of laser vision correction may actually be mitigated even further. So you're already taking the best studied procedure in the human body that is shown time and time again to be safe and effective and taking something that can maybe even be less invasive. That's that's quite exciting. You know, and that's that's really compelling. Now, we do need to access advancements that Asia and Europe have realized over the years in lenticular extraction, I think to really uh, get on par with some of our LASIK outcomes. And, you know, the, the literature is mixed, um, but we know that lenticular extraction works. Uh, it's got all the benefits we just mentioned. And, uh, you know, one of the things with femtosecond lasers is that each part of the stroma reacts differently to a femtosecond laser because the anterior stroma is so different from the posterior stroma. And so this 
really requires fine tuning of the of these procedures to really optimize them for quick uh, recovery, predictable outcomes, and and that's one of the other neat things about lenticular extraction is uh, what appears to be um, we're getting uh, seeing signals of stability, long term stability. That that is also sort of a seems to be a um, somewhat of a, a more unique, a nuanced but unique feature of lenticular extraction. So, I think it's really exciting, and and um, we're you know there's a whole entire Congress now on lenticular extraction and and lenticular addition even, and that's a whole new field as well. What, what are your thoughts on on this, and what are you seeing, and and what was your experience in Asia? Well, gosh, I think in Asia, if it's a preview of what's to come, lenticular extraction is definitely going to play a major part in the refractive offerings we have for our patients. And I think some of the benefits, you know, being flapless and perhaps, you know, causing quicker recovery, less inducement of dry eye. Over time, we need more research to really show whether that's significant or not. But at least the fact that we're moving towards a procedure, which some might you know, describe as less invasive um, is exciting, but I think it's important when we're talking to our patients not to compare these technologies. You know, they're all wonderful technologies and they're different and uh, we don't want to confuse our patients. And so um, I think keeping that conversation easy to understand for our patients and giving the surgeon's best recommendation is something that we keep in mind as we discuss all these new technologies with our patients. One term that I've heard uh few surgeons using now is laser-assisted lenticular extraction. I think that's a wonderful patient-friendly term to use Lalex with our patients in addition to Kalex with our uh, with our colleagues in the scientific literature. And I think as we're moving towards reducing invasiveness with corneal refractive surgery, I think the next phase is actually something very exciting in which that you can even alter, you know, the refractive index of the cornea um, to correct a patient's vision. So without having to ablate or remove tissue, I think that is the pinnacle of uh, minimally invasive refractive surgery. So we'd love to hear your thoughts about that sort of technology. Well, I, I share your enthusiasm. The field of refractive indexing, which is what you've just described, is really, really exciting. Upstream, but that's a lot of often where the excitement is, is upstream. And so we, um, what is refractive indexing? Essentially, this also utilizes femtosecond lasers, but for a different application. So this is selectively changing the refractive index um, of a shape. And, and think about it as though you're creating a three-dimensional shape in an optical structure. That You can do this in the cornea. You can do it uh, in a contact lens. You can do it in an intraocular lens. These are repeatable, minimally invasive, as you mentioned, um, do not ablate tissue, uh, do not create a lamellar flap or a lamellar cut, uh, it does not create um, a lenticule that's removed, uh, there is no tissue removed actually. Um, and real interesting, the laboratory science um, uh, for the corneal application shows that there's minimal inflammation and we don't see the traditional inflammatory uh, temporary healing cascades that we may see uh, with other um, current forms of vision correction. And so this is really, really exciting when we think about the broad applications such as um, third world applications. We know there's an um, and, and, uh, there's an epidemic of myopia and, and frankly, there's an epidemic of um, amitropia. And if we think about all of a sudden we could take something into the field, which essentially has, um, you know, very little risk and very little recovery. Uh, and with a broad application, it just, you know, it's, a, it's an, a, there's extraordinary potential. The lens applications um, are, are particularly exciting. You know, this is something where we'll be able to use a laser, apply it to, um, most intraocular lenses that are already implanted, and you, this can be repeated. It's done in an office setting uh, with light and can be used to uh, take control of just about any optical circumstance, whether it's low order, higher order aberrations, um, uh, the treatment of, uh, adding uh, multifocality, extended depth of focus features, reversing multifocality, uh, customizing. Um, uh, Q factors. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that uh, can potentially be done with this. The early uh, human data 
is actually quite promising. And so this is something that holds great promise for the future, again, upstream. But if we really want to kind of expand our thinking a little bit, imagine bringing an intraocular lens in the office that is optimized for refractive indexing. Uh, your client sits at a diagnostic device, picks their own treatment on what they want to see. You treat the lens outside of the eye and create a customized lens. And then you put it in, in your office, and then you can change it um, over and over and over again and uh, customize it to account for effective lens position and, and other things that we're having trouble predicting. Um, and you've just taken care of stocking and consignment. So this gets really disruptive really quick and, and it's just really neat. I'm super excited about that. And I love that being able to change refractive index, I really do see that as the future for both corneal and IOL-based refractive surgery because of its minimum invasive. But while you were talking, it did remind me of some of the older technologies that we have had. So it makes me feel like it's not that far into the future, you know, with the minimal invasiveness of the uh, changing of the cornea, the refractive index, it reminded me of conductive keratoplasty a little bit. But um, the issue is with that, of course, is the long-term result. So it'll be interesting to see now that they're doing some trials in humans, how long this refractive index change actually persists in the cornea. Um, and then same with the IOL, you know, a lot of what you described, the process sounds very similar to us who are using the light adjustable lens, right? So we're already familiar with that post-operative adjustment, but I understand that this is a technology that's actually changing the refractive index of the IOL, which makes it a little bit different. I'm sure we'll see some uh, differences in the advantages that it can add compared to what we have now. So we've talked a lot about the newer technologies um, and what we can you know, do for our patients to make their vision better, but what kind of updates in the workflow systems in refractive surgery have you seen that you think can you know help us better improve our workflow efficiency in our practice but also optimize precision and IOL selection for our patients uh, Dagny we've really enjoyed veracity uh, over the years that's um, been a wonderful addition to our practice uh, it streamlined the flow uh, we think it is safer for our patients because it reduces transcription error. Uh, and that it pulls information from your diagnostics devices directly. And it brings a higher level of precision to our surgical planning and things that um, that I was uh, doing on paper or in my head for years and years and years uh, with weighted means of multiple uh, diagnostic devices for things like astigmatism correction where this actually takes it at another uh, few levels with optimized formulas specifically for multiple inputs and um, direct inputs, not only from the anterior surface of the cornea, but direct outputs from the posterior surface of the cornea as well. And now we have corneal OCT to directly measure the posterior cornea. So uh, we're now able to utilize this to understand things that We've, we've really only had access to nomograms, uh, thanks to the work of Doug, Koch, and others, um, uh, to guesstimate with normative data uh, the role of the posterior cornea. Now we can actually measure it. This has totally stretched our thinking, and, and we just have so much fun looking at this, and we we're just always tickled because you know, we we do a lot of um, high-definition wavefront in our practice, and so we're, we we can corroborate the um, influence of the posterior cornea so much that when people have no anterior corneal astigmatism, we're treating just their posterior cornea because there's no anterior corneal astigmatism to neutralize the posterior cornea. So we think, you know, this is really going to sort of set the stage for low diopter uh, toricity, um, which is, uh, is really has to happen at some point um, in, for the United States. And uh, it's just it's just been a great a great tool uh, in our toolbox. What about you? Have you are, are you um, what what are you, if you don't mind me asking what what are your um, kind of new workflow um, uh, advances and and things that you're that you're enjoying in your practice? Well, I have to say I'm not as lucky as some of the other more advanced practices with the bells and whistles, but I am very much looking forward to incorporating that into the near future, either Veracity or even the smart cataract system, because I do use, um, you know, the Argus biometer and some of those might speak a little better to each other. But I love that all the companies are on the same wavelength of, you know, 
making our workflow more efficient. I'm also excited for the future of how we can improve our workflow efficiency by making the capturing of diagnostics easier. Like everything is becoming all in one. You know, there's some products now that are you, through ray tracing, you're able to not only get the best, you know, topography and tear segment cornea data, but also combined with axial length and uh, ACD, help you better predict effective lens position, where you can have an all-in-one device for all of your refractive needs from cornea to IOL selection. So that'll really streamline, I think, our diagnostics and what our technicians have to do in practice. And same thing with the therapeutics. I'm very excited for the refractive surgery um, instruments in the future where it will be combined femtosecond, eczema, and even lenticular um, extraction-based technology all in one machine. So you don't have to move the patient around. Um, so that's something that I'm very excited to see as well. So this has been wonderful. We've discussed a lot of technologies from, you know, cornea to IOL. And, you know, you are a, you know, a wonderful pioneer of refractive surgery, George. So I would love to discuss with you a little bit of how your practice patterns have evolved over the years, especially in the treatment of presbyopia, you know, and do you find yourself moving from more of the corneal based therapies to IOL based, especially with all the newer IOLs that are coming out, including some of the, you know, small aperture lenses, the accommodating, accommodating lenses in the future, you know, do you think we're better able to address presbyopia for those patients with these newer IOL based technology? Um, you know, I think you and I uh, share um, an interest and in, uh, passion in uh, the surgical correction of presbyopia. And I think it's kind of, I'm sure you would agree, generally speaking, it makes most sense when you're fixing something to go to the source of the problem. And that was sort of part of the idea of when we introduced the concept of dysfunctional lens syndrome uh, in 2008 with Dan Dury and Jason Stahl, it was the syndromic nature of the aging lens. And so the idea is that it, it, instead of sort of putting a doing a placeholder with laser vision correction, which definitely works, and 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 we still do this, it may make more sense to go to the source of the problem. And well, why is that? Well, if we we kind of think about the life cycle of hyperopic laser vision correction, which works great, we still do it, and we've done it for a long time. Generally speaking, it tends to regress um, because of epithelial hyperplasia and the mid periphery around the treatment and hypoplasia over the uh, hyperprolate treatment. Number two, the um, refractive need increases of that patient um, over the years because they're um, losing their accommodation. So it, it's sort of um, going the wrong way uh, relative to say the myopic laser, or laser vision correction treatment where epithelial hyperplasia tends to work in their favor with regression, they lose effect, but they're, um, that's working in the right direction uh, for their refractive error with age. So, um, so we've, we've really shifted towards lens-based procedures for presbyopia. Historically, when we proposed the staging of lens dysfunction and, and the presbyopia correction algorithms, it was really stage two where we recommended lens replacement. And that's really the thinking has really evolved. Um, stage two, by definition, again, as, as we defined it, was really some early opacities in the lens. We're now really doing this for stage one, where it's appropriate and safe, um, for the reasons that I just mentioned. And in fact, just to kind of be a little controversial, we're, if we think about um, uh, things like latent hyperopia, you know, should we not be considering that as a subtype of lens dysfunction? I mean, we really teach our patients this is really premature aging, and um, we're, we've uh, done uh, laser vision correction on these patients for years, but they typically will have a short lifespan, and then you've got limited options for the future potentially with IOLs um, because we don't want to combine uh, negative asphericity. And so, um, of which there's really only one or two two lenses available in the U.S. that that don't use negative asphericity. This is something that we're really using lens-based procedures early and earlier in life uh, to treat these other forms of lens dysfunction, and including um, hyperopia, which many of us become manifest hyperopes because we're we have some degree of latency and we're not able to account for that through age. And so our distance vision drifts too. 
So these are subtle nuances of lens dysfunction where we really think these patients are best served long-term, plus it, ob it obviates the need for a, a subsequent procedure in many cases and, and prevents the um, falling off the vision cliff through life and including uh, um, cataract surgery. What, what, what about you? What are your thoughts on that? And, and how has your practice kind of evolved over the years? Well, George, you and I are on the same page with this. I mean, we really push for a lens-based uh, therapy whenever possible because of the longevity. And thank you so much for pointing the dysfunctional lens terminology. I use that all the time with my patients. And when I explain to them that we're going to replace your lens that's no longer functioning anymore with a new lens that will last you for a lifetime, they really understand that and they're eager to do it. And you're right, it doesn't always correlate with the appearance of the lens, right? I really like to measure the function of the patient's uh, you know, near vision. I like to measure their accommodative reserve, the severity of the presbyopia to decide if they would be a good lens exchange uh, candidate rather than just looking at the appearance of the lens. It doesn't always correlate. And you'd be surprised how many patients you consider young, you know, 40, but they're already J16. They've lost all that accommodative reserve. And so those are definitely patients who would benefit for a, from a lens exchange. And I agree with you, latent hyperopia is a huge problem too. If you only address the cornea, I mean, they're going to be back in glasses again after a year. They're going to be very upset with you. So totally on the same page. And I think that as these IOL technologies continue to improve, we're only going to be able to provide better and safer outcomes for these patients as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Waring, for the excellent discussion. And thank you all for listening. Please remember to take the post-test and evaluation to receive CME credit and to tune in for additional episodes within the podcast series.